Hi everyone, welcome to the May edition of Wavelength. Well, we're up here at Works Dam near Marble Falls where the LCRA Board of Directors is holding their April meeting. Now, directors took time after the meeting to tour the facilities here. They're undergoing a massive overhaul as part of LCRA's dam modernization program. Wirtz Dam was completed in 1951, and as far as anyone can remember, this is the first time that an LCRA board meeting was held here. Directors got a first-hand look at the progress of this phase of construction designed to make Wirtz Dam safe for the next 50 years. One primary focus of this project is to build concrete stair steps which will cover the earthen portion of the dam. This will prevent erosion and failure of the dam in the event of a flood which would come over top of the structure. We can see from what's happening in the Dakotas right now, uh, a 500 year flood is a definite possibility at some time and if that event ever happened, it would, uh, could threaten this facility right here. So that's what's going on is to strengthen the, the spillway section of the dam. As you can see the, the work that's going on here behind me and uh, the uh, thought it appropriate for the board to come up and kind of see what all was going on and how their construction was progressing. LCRA's dam modernization project is a 15-year, $43 million program, which will include improvements at all six dams in the Highland Lakes chain. Just before we completed this program, the Texas Senate approved the six new LCRA board members appointed by Governor George W. Bush. Board Chair Mike Luxinger had this advice for the new members. I'll kind of go back and, and reflect on uh, when I came on the board, and I, have, I hear this comment from a lot of the board members when they first come on the board, is they don't, didn't realize the uh, many facets that make up the LCRA, from the uh, electric generation to flood control to, to water sales, and uh, to just to, to, to get out and to, to meet all the employees and uh, our, our customers that live from, from San Saba to, to Matagorda to out in the hill country to, to east of here. Uh, and that's, that's where the LCRA is. Uh, it, it's, it's out here in, in serving the, the people of, of central Texas and down on the Gulf Coast, down the river, and to, to get to know everybody. Uh, and, and who it is that we serve and the great employees and the staff that we have who think the, and realize what a, a great organization the authority is. We will introduce the new board members to you on the next Wavelength. Well, the Texas Legislature is hard at work once again and the LCRA is attracting attention in a number of different committees. Now, although it's impossible for us to give you any up-to-the-minute information, we did ask General Manager Mark Rose for a glimpse at what's happening. Well, the legislature is still in session and there's a host of bills that all affect the LCRA. Uh, I, I think it's given us an opportunity to tell our story. Uh, we've appeared a couple of times before the House Natural Resources Committee. The, the bill to sell the LCRA is still pending before the committee. Uh, I, I learned a long time ago not to predict the, the legislature, but uh, I will say that I, mean, I feel like we've uh, told our story well and that uh, a lot of folks uh, understand and in fact have told me they appreciate the job that we're doing. Again, the way I approach all this is what, I, is what I've always said. I mean, we have an important mission and we're doing a good job. Uh, the, customer, the customer support that has come forward has been tremendous and uh, so we have a lot to be proud for and if you're worried about your future at LCRA or what we're doing here, the best way you can handle that is just to continue to keep doing your job and do it well and that's, that's the best medicine that's out there. Three years ago, when the LCRA joined the statewide initiative known as Clean Industries 2000, we set a goal to reduce the amount of waste generated at the agency by 50 percent. Since that time, each of the LCRA facilities has implemented programs to reach that goal. The agency has been on a trash diet, so to speak, through a methodical process that centers on environmental response teams at each of the facilities the agency is making tremendous strides at exceeding the goal set by Clean Industries 2000. Now in a minute we'll take you around the company and show you some examples of how we're reducing our waste. But this program is more than just reducing waste. It's about changing the way we think about waste. What this program does is break old habits and reinforces the concept that every small effort makes a big difference. Gail Byler and Emil Sodalak are members of the FPP environmental team. 
They're showing their counterparts from the Sim Gideon and Ferguson plants some of the various things that they have done to reduce waste at the plants. Not only has FPP reduced the number of hazardous solvents they use, but they recently purchased this distillation unit which processes both citrus solvents and antifreeze. This is the solvent when it's spent, this is when it's used up. We used to send it off site for disposal at a significant cost. And this is uh, collected and, and brought up here. We place it in here, this is a 15 gallon unit. And it's heated up, the vacuum is pulled, the vapor is, is pulled across, which is the, the new reclaimed usable solvent. And this is what it looks like when it comes out. The plant is also phasing out the use of paint thinners and introduced a new product called Safe Strip. It helps minimize waste and is much safer for employees. In the automotive area, there is an oil filter crusher which helps reduce waste and the plants make it easier to reuse oily rags and floor sweeps. FPP, like the service center, uses a fluorescent bulb crusher which filters out the mercury and allows the remaining glass to be classified as non-hazardous. And soon, the plant will phase in low mercury lights to further reduce the waste. Aerosol cans that used to be class two hazardous waste are now punctured, drained, and recycled. And finally, there are workplace recycling stations that make it easy for employees to recycle office paper, aluminum, cardboard, and glass. And the best news is there's a lot more that's happening at FPP. We haven't even mentioned the composting program, the plastics recycling, the used oil collection, the hazardous waste tracking logs, and the waste procedure manuals, just to name a few. And in addition to making good sense, it's paying off. By using a formula that calculates disposal costs, risk liability, and labor, the Fayette Power Project alone saves $2.5 million a year. And our other facilities are making great strides, too. At the Sim Gideon plant, they recently worked with a painting contractor to develop a process that cost less and generated a fraction of the waste. It was estimated that 290 tons of waste would be generated by this paint contract. And since the um, cost for disposal was placed on the contractor himself, they take all efforts to try to minimize the waste. At the Ferguson Power Plant, they've implemented many of the same programs as FPP. They recycle their used oil, rags, paper, cardboard, and aerosol cans. They have a bulb crusher, too. They also put an end to storing materials they never used. It's like safety. Safety's been preached to us for years and years and years, and it's just natural to grab your hard hat and safety glasses. Environmental issues are new to us. It's something, it's a steep learning curve for most folks. Uh, what to do with a dirty rag. You know, it used to be real simple, go throw it in the dumpster. Now, they're having to think about it. And uh, it's all part of changing the culture. And on every Monday, workers from a local MHMR facility come out to the plant to pick up recyclable materials. Employees here are also involved on the front end of projects to ensure that nothing gets purchased that won't be needed for the project. As Barton says, don't buy a gallon if a quart will do the job. All of these efforts have put the LCRA in front of the pack and has earned the recognition of Barry McBee, the chairman of the Texas Natural Resource Conservation Commission. The LCRA also, I think, um, helps lead the way in a number of the other activities that are part of Clean Industries 2000. So we want to focus on what's going on at the facility, but we want to have a broader view. We want to reach out to the citizens around these facilities. LCRA does that through their citizen advisory panel. The LCRA employees know that what they are accomplishing is important, and they feel good about it. Our children, our grandchildren are coming along. I want them to have the same enjoyment that I have had because I've seen a lot of pollution and a lot of changes uh, in my lifetime, and I know what it can be like, so I feel like if I, I'm doing a good job, then maybe I'm going to affect generations to come. Soon the LCRA will begin to offer its expertise in cutting waste to our customers and we'll explain more about that program in our next show. LCRA crews from dam and hydroelectric operations have once again taken on the daunting task of clearing debris from Lake OBJ. The last round of flooding on the Lano River swept away boat docks and left the lake littered with huge trees and logs. 
According to hydro manager Bob Foster, they've already removed over 170 tons of debris. It is being piled up and burned at specific collection sites around the lake. The operation will continue at least through Memorial Day. Well, this summer, for the first time ever, the LCRA will attempt to get every single employee together at one place at one time. Now, although the details and the agenda and the location are still being worked out, we talked with Mark Rose about what we might expect that day. Well, we're starting a new tradition at the LCRA, and that's getting everybody that we possibly can together in one place and hand out our service awards and our gain sharing checks talk a little bit about what we've done this past year and then also talk about what we're going to do the next year. So August 11th uh, is the date that we've picked. We'll do it going forward the second Monday uh, of each August uh, and I, I think it will be a special time for folks. Let's get ready to rock the river. Even a rainy Saturday morning couldn't dampen the spirits of these students attending the 1997 Colorado River Watch Network Symposium. 63 students and sponsors from 13 schools attended this year's event held at Bisher State Park in Bastrop County. The River Watch Network is made up of citizen and student volunteers throughout the Colorado River watershed. There are 59 active sites and 850 monitors involved in Riverwatch currently. They are all trained and equipped by the LCRA, and volunteers then test the water quality in their area and send the results to Austin. The Riverwatch network is very healthy, and it's the, the interest is still there. Communities are still calling. We want to join. Uh, one thing that we have done in the last couple of years is distribute the network a little bit more so that it will represent the basin more effectively. We've established new sites in San Saba on the Llano River, the first site that we've ever had there, a uh, site in Burnett. So we, we kind of concentrated a little bit upstream uh, and less focused on central Austin because we have some other groups, the city of Austin and Travis County, for instance, that are supporting monitoring in central Texas, right there in Austin. So we're concentrating our efforts a little bit more in the rural communities. Uh, trying to support those folks that might otherwise not get the opportunity to participate in a program like this. What we usually test, it's usually slow moving flow unless we've had a lot of rain previous to that. Back at the symposium, students are asked to make a poster presentation and give an oral report to the group about their testing program. The Riverwatch experience seems to give students a new appreciation for the river and the environment in general. I like being able to do real work in the real world that I feel actually makes a difference. And I see the effects of things on the creek and the river, such as construction and uh, runoff from the road. It's a really great program. I'm in biology and pre-AP, which is advanced placement biology. And every Tuesday we go out to the river and we test and nitrate, phosphate, fecal coliform, the temperature of the air and water, and dissolved oxygen. and and really, is a you get to be with your friends, and you get to learn about the environment and the river. And I did not know about the river. All I knew it was a part of water until I got involved in this group. And I really have learned a lot about how it affects our community. LaGrange High School was given the award for best presentation at the symposium, while Smithville High School was given the Riverwatch Warrior Award by staff for outstanding achievement during the past year. If your school or organization is interested in joining the Colorado River Watch Network, contact Jason Pinchback at 473-3200, extension 7859. And uh, what is it that might contaminate or pollute the water? 1997 is also the second year for Eco Camp. This two-day, one-night camp held at Lake Travis gives inner city fourth and fifth graders an opportunity to get out into nature and learn about the environment. And it's one of those programs where we've got inner city kids out enjoying the land, learning about water quality, they're canoeing, they're learning about land use issues. Uh, these are kids that don't normally get out of their neighborhoods very much. About 150 students will attend the camp over a five-week period. They will learn about composting, recycling, water quality, and they get a chance to go hiking and canoeing. EcoCamp is hosted by the Friends of the Colorado River Foundation with corporate sponsorship provided by BFI. 
uh, sponsorship of EcoCamp is very consistent with uh, our role as the leading recycler in sec Central Texas. And um, it's also very consistent with our, uh, our philosophy to reduce, reuse, and uh, recycle. And we, um, uh, we think EcoCamp is really important for, um, for the, this generation who in turn will teach the uh, future generations about the importance of environmental conservation. BFI has donated $32,000 over a three-year period to make sure that this outdoor environmental classroom continues to give Austin grade schoolers an opportunity to learn about the environment through hands-on experience. Springtime in Central Texas means two things, wildflowers and river fests along the Colorado River Trail. This year during March, April, and May, 20 communities host events from San Saba all the way down to Bay City on the Texas coast. These River Fest events help celebrate the Colorado River Trail, a driving trail along the 500-mile lower Colorado River Valley. It's designed to bring people back to the river and to historic and friendly communities nearby. Events range from the Blue Bonnet Festival in Burnett to Yesterfest in Bastrop and Paddle Fest on Town Lake in Austin. If you'd like more information about River Fest, call 1-888-TEXAS-FUN. Now here's an interesting recipe. You take one-third biosolids, two-thirds organic materials, let the mixture cook at 131 degrees for 15 days, turn occasionally, and voila. No, it's not an award-winning cake. It's Highland Lakes compost and it can do wonders for you would-be gardeners even if you don't have a green thumb. This is the Highland Lakes Biosolids Complex in Burnett, Texas. It's a joint venture between the LCRA, City of Burnett, City of Marble Falls, Kingsland Municipal Utility District, and Lake LBJ Municipal Utility District. These communities bring in the raw materials which will make up the compost. Sludge from the wastewater treatment plants and leaves, grass clippings, and wood chips from their citizens. This gives you the ability to instead of taking it to a, a landfill or just applying it just as a raw product, uh, you know, which is not suitable for human consumption, turning it into something that's usable. Another thing is the amendment, uh, the carbon, the trees, ground up trees and leaves. Again, it's just a product that fills up the landfills and, and this is a product that can be used and put anywhere that you want to put it. It breaks it down into a usable product. After the mixture has been properly aged and mixed, the communities get back a useful product. Here in the city ourselves, we're using it on our parks and we've got a, a fairly new go golf course, about four years old, which we're going planning on uh, using as much as we can get on it this summer. And that too should be a great benefit to it. In Kingsland, officials have plans to make the compost more readily available to the public. Right now they had to come in and had to haul it out and if they're on a small basis, there's five gallon buckets or so forth, but we do let them take it off in a trailer. And of course everything that goes got a permit that goes with it. And uh, but if we had it in bags, whether they can have it in a forty pound bag, well then the, we could load it up in the back end of the car and it wouldn't get everywhere and then they take it home, put it in their flowers or on their garden. The facility will celebrate its first year anniversary in August. In the May edition of the LCRA News, read about LCRA's cleanup efforts on Lake LBJ, where tons of debris have washed in from the Llano River floods. And you can read about the rich history of the land surrounding the Fayette Power Project near LaGrange. Protected by a chain of lakes and dams, most central Texans consider themselves relatively safe from catastrophic flooding. But would those dams hold in the wake of record-setting rainfall? Officials with the LCRA asked those questions several years ago. Now they're in the midst of a $43 million improvement effort to make sure that all area dams could withstand the worst possible flooding. KB24's Robbie Owens joins us tonight from the Mansfield Dam with more. Robbie, are any of the dams actually in danger of failing right now? No, Bob, absolutely not. Although several of those structures are being strengthened, officials say none are in danger of failing. The purpose of these upgrades, though, is to make sure that if the worst possible flood imaginable occurred, say three feet of rain within three days, then these dams would still be okay. But as a matter of fact, Mansfield Dam here is already strong enough to withstand such a flood. But that wasn't the case at all of the dams. 
lakes and dams and attempts to control Mother Nature, but at times to no avail. But it's too quick, too soon. Too much scope there. Ward's Dam was built around 1950 to withstand the worst flooding that could be imagined at that time. Heavy rain's now down along the coast. Here's KB-24 pinpoint Doppler radar. The rain but with improvements in weather forecasting and computer radar, officials now know that the worst and could be worse than they thought. The leaks could possibly see 12 to 14 foot of water over the top of Ward's Dam in the worst case. So LCRA civil engineer Richard Fishoff is overseeing $22 million in repairs to just to strengthen and upgrade work. So we've got an earthen embankment holding up a reinforced concrete wall. If that reinforced wall fails because of the loss of support due to the earth, then of course we've got a breach and the potential loss of life downstream. To make sure the dam's earthen retaining wall holds, tons of soil cement will be anchored to this foundation of natural solid granite. The soil cement is made of recycled fly ash from the LaGrange power plant. Soil and cement. Kept moist for a week, the mixture will be five times stronger than most home foundations. Once we've completed that, then we feel that this dam can handle anything that might be sent our way. In addition to those planned improvements, some extra ones include an emergency action plan and money for extra maintenance. And just in case you're wondering, no state or local tax dollars will be spent on those renovations. The revenues from the sale of the LCRA's water services and hydroelectricity will pick up the entire $43 million tax. That's good news on a big project. Thanks, Bobby. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to News 36 First Cast Saturday. We are along the shores of Sound Lake for Paddlefest 97. And uh, the Lower Colorado River Authority, a big part of uh, Paddlefest third annual That's event right. here uh, underneath the Mopac Bridge. And uh, here from the Lower Colorado River Authority is Robert Cohen. Good morning, Robert. Good morning. Great, great, great. How are you doing? Doing great. Good. Good. Tell us uh, why um, LCRA um, likes to get involved in events like this to, well, to encourage people yeah. to get into water sports and things. Well, simply put, it's our job. Uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, interview's okay. over. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, we're, as steward of the state's waters, the Colorado River, uh, we really have a responsibility to give people the opportunity, give Texans the opportunity to enjoy the river. You know, we have four million people a year who visit the Highland Lake, and we have a million people a year who visit the parks along the Colorado River. We really want to get a lot of people using the river, especially downstream of Austin, because it's really an unnoticed gem. Since people uh, maybe enjoying the river, going to the river more and appreciating it, uh, maybe encourage people to keep it clean? Uh... Oh, absolutely. We also have an ulterior motive, and that's simply that the more people who really enjoy the river and get to know the river, uh, the more friends the Colorado River will have. And uh, this river will need a lot of friends in the next 20 years as population growth and competing demands on the river um, increase the need for planning and management. I would almost think if, if it's that valuable of a resource that you would want to discourage people from actually getting on it. I mean, that would, does that no, generate people, pollution? Not at all. The people who use the river for recreational purposes are really the people who, uh, who care for it most. And, and, and in fact, part of this event today is a, is a cleanup. And there are spots on the river you can only clean up by canoe or kayak. Uh, no, the people in the river really enjoy it, and, and they really take care of the river. Yeah, we've been talking about this morning. This is a wonderful opportunity. There's all, all kinds of kayaks and canoes instructors where you can, uh, beginners can go and learn uh, the basics of, of the sports and how to get into it. But also, uh, this is a chance today to come out and see some, some real pros later today. Yeah, for the first time in Austin, uh, we're going to have the national trials for the U.S. Canoe and Kayak Marathon team. Um, these are folks who will be coming from New York, Florida, Georgia, uh, Indiana, across the United States to try their best uh, to win a marathon race. Tell us what is a canoe or kayak marathon? It's really tough. Uh, it's 25 kilometers wow. uh, or 18 miles uh, up and down the river. Uh, and that's going to be a tough race. The top uh, one and two finishers in each of the classes then move on, <coughs> excuse me, become part of the U.S. Canoe and Kayak Marathon team and can compete on that team in national and international competition. Wow, so this is a big deal for us. It's a big deal for us. That's great. Hey, I usually have, uh, LCRA has a lot of uh, events uh, up and down the river this time of year. Anything else uh, coming up soon? Yeah, you know, the, uh, the river fest that began uh, three or four years ago has really taken off, and now there are 20 events. Uh, that are part of the River Fest, which is wow. a great opportunity for people to go out and enjoy the river, but also just enjoy small town life around Texas. Uh, 
you can, uh, for more information, you can call 1-888-TEXAS-FUND, and we'll send you any kind of information that you want uh, about these events. It's a great time. It starts right about this time of year, probably last through. Oh, it's wildflower heaven. Right. You go out there and drive around, oh, and it's just a terrific opportunity to see the best of Texas. Okay. Robert, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Okay. Fill it us in, one eight eight eight. Fun. That's easy to remember. Yeah, no kidding. Paddle okay. Fest uh, here under the Mopac Bridge beginning at 9, and uh, you can park over at Austin High. Two brothers in the street for a final showdown. Well, that's it for this edition of Wavelength. We'll look forward to seeing you again next month. As she hears two shots ring out, panic fills her heart as she pushes through the crowd. Both men lay there dying, their guns still in their hands, sun